today called Real Salvation. I had several on Salvation. This is a little... That's all right. I feel like I'm writing on and nobody listening to me. Ooh. That's just fine. My wife does it all the time. She talks all the time and seems like she's talking to herself just because I'm not listening. But. And so I feel right at home if I ramble on and nobody looks up. I'm just kidding. It's so nice to be here. Like I was saying, we're going to be talking about real salvation. The difference of what we, we talked about, how to be saved and all those different things. But today we're going to be talking about, you know, what does salvation really truly mean? Last week it was kind of a Valentine's thing. We talked about marriage and relationships and we were opening up 1 Peter chapter 2 and 3. And this week we're going to move right along into 1 John 2 and 3. And I don't really have any ancillary scriptures for dawn today. And so if you would have Bibles with you, because we try to encourage people to actually look in that big thick book that, that's there. <laughs> that some people aren't really used to looking into, maybe, but hopefully, there, he's got his, okay. <laughs> so if we're in First John 2 and 3, so if we can start with a word of prayer here. Let's start here right now. That's First John 2 and 3, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your words that you've given and the sermons that you've been able to to let me preach and things, Lord. I pray that you would just open the hearts and eyes and minds and ears of these people, that you would give them a message to seal to their heart. I pray, Lord, that it would be a blessing to them and that they would help know the difference about what talking about salvation and what real salvation is. And so I thank you for that, Lord. I just pray that you would just bless this service and anoint it in a big way. And I thank you again for hearing our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the devil is a real counterfeiter. He would just soon, I've said many times, send you to hell from the pew as he would the gutter. And we'll be talking about that. As a matter of fact, I think he would rather have you have a form of religion, but not to have a genuine and real, real salvation. I believe that the curse of our 21st century in this Laodicea period is that we have many churches that are filled with baptized pagans. I mean, a whole church of empty people. Ones who have never really been saved. They have culture, but they don't really have Calvary. I mean, they have ritual, but they don't have reality. And they have a form, but they don't have force. They have religion, but they don't have righteousness. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, what it means to have real salvation. So I'm going to begin and start reading here in chapter 3. We're going to read chapter 3, verses 4 through 9. Here we go. Read along with me. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested, manifested means made known, incarnated, made into the flesh so we could see him, to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested. That's why he did. And he, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. So there we have it. And you say, now many people sin because they have a gross misunderstanding about what true salvation is. And this is, a, we're going to go ahead and take this passage of Scripture right here and break it up into three divisions today. On your outline, first of all, as we start, we are going to see, first of all, number one on your outline, the rebellion that proves our sinfulness. The rebellion that proves it. 
Now, sometimes we sit in churches well-dressed and with a benign smile on our faces, but God looks down into our heart and God sees the rebellion that is there. Let's look at it again in verse 4. It says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, there are many definitions of sin in the Bible, and this is perhaps one of the clearest and best. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth the law. And so sin, on your outline, is breaking God's law. That's what sin is. It's breaking God's law. And the Bible says in Romans 14, 23, whosoever is not of faith is sin. That's a good definition of sin. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 17, wherefore for him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Then in 1 John 5, 17, it says, all unrighteousness is sin. And ultimately, those are all definitions of sin. But this is the clearest and most concise. Sin is the transgression of the law. Let me just put it another way. Sin is lawlessness. And I tell you, that's what sin is. You see, God made everything. God created the whole universe. And God built into the universe laws, physical laws, and moral laws. And the whole universe works according to the fixed laws of God. Well, why did God give law? Well, he wanted order. And we use the term today always, law and order. Because without law, there is no, on your outline, order. Without law, there is no order. Without law, rather than having cosmos, which we talk about as a world order, you have chaos. The law of the jungle. Chaos. And so God made everything. God made the stars to move in their orbit. God made the tides to ebb and flow. God made your body to work according to certain principles. And these are built into nature. And they are built into the moral system of things also. So materially and morally, there are laws. Now, often we talk about the laws of nature, but there are no laws of nature. There are God's laws that nature on your outline obeys. They're God's laws that nature obeys. Do you understand that? Do you know that we have a generation of people today that are talking about Mother Earth? And what they need to be talking about is Father God. And you know we no longer have Easter so important, but we have Earth Day. And I guess it's so we can go out and worship dirt. <laughs> Listen, the whole universe works according to the law. For example, there's the law of gravity. It's like when you get up to a 10-story building and you step out the window, you're not going to break the law of gravity. No, you're going to demonstrate it. Isn't that right? You're going to be broken on it. And you may think after you jump, well, everything's going good for a while. You might pass the first window and you think, well, it's okay so far. But friend, there is in God's laws also laws for those who transgress God's laws. And like in the physical universe, there are laws, and ultimately you don't break the law of gravity, you are broken on it. But also in the moral universe, there are laws. We have the Ten Commandments, and again, you don't break the Ten Commandments. You are broken on the Ten Commandments. The Bible says that if you transgress God's Ten Commandments, then you are a sinner. And sin is what? We read it. Sin is the transgression of the law. And so if you sin, it makes you an outlaw. And you say, well, why did God give us all these old laws anyway? I mean, it would have been a whole lot better if we didn't have all these laws. Is God some kind of a cruel and vengeful deity up there in heaven making all these rules just to make a squirm like a worm in hot ashes trying to keep them? No. The laws are for your, on your outline, your welfare. Therefore, your welfare. If we didn't have God's laws of gravity here, we'd, be, we'd have to pull you off the ceiling. And also morally, the laws for your welfare. Every time God says, thou shalt not, he is saying, don't hurt yourself. And every time God says, thou shalt, he's saying, help yourself to happiness. And you see, God doesn't need anything. He has everything. And God made these laws for us. And sin is a transgression of the law. And when we transgress, we break God's laws, but mostly we break God's heart. 
Because God loves us so much. However, there is the lawless spirit in all of us. Sometimes we hide that lawless spirit in our heart. For example, there are some people who are rebels and we look at these people and they have open defiance and people that do crime and rape and murder and hatred and violence and things and we call those people outlaws. And but really all of us are outlaws because the Bible says that sin is transgression of the law. And the Bible says that all have sinned. So that means all of us have transgressed the laws. There is not a person here who can say, I've never ever broke the Ten Commandments ever. <laughs> Sometimes we're very smug and we're very sophisticated in the way that we live. However, we have sins of the Spirit. And ultimately, they're just as bad in God's sight. Sin is sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. <clears throat> However, they may not have the same repercussions. But sin is sin, and sin is the transgression of the law. Now, don't tell me today that all the laws that we have, you haven't broken. I want to talk to you about all the laws that you have broken. Now, we've tried to do everything about lawlessness and this rebellion that's in the world. I mean, like I've said before, we've tried education. Like, do you think that you're going to change the hearts by education? No. Nazi Germany was educated. And somebody said, if you take an ignorant man, he'll steal a watermelon off the boxcar, but if you give him an education, he'll steal the whole railroad. He just becomes a clever devil. So education is not the answer. We've tried psychology, and we think that perhaps we can train people and analyze them, and we still have this flood of lawlessness anyway. We've tried legislation, laws about it and stuff. We've tried the police force and to enforce all of it and stuff. We've tried prisons and prisons today have just become a swamp of discontentment and hatred where the mosquitoes of crime breed all the more. When we let people out of prison, they just go right back to crime. And it's because the problem is in the heart. And ultimately, you can restrain a man outwardly that he is still a rebel in his heart. Reminds me of a story about a mother who had a son who was disobeying her, and so she made her son go into the closet for a little while because she thought it would be a good punishment for him. And she put him in the closet and shut the closet door, and it was real quiet in there for a long time. And she got a little concerned, and she said, Johnny, what are you doing in there? And he said, well, I spit on your shoes, and I spit on your dress, and I spit on your coat, and I'm waiting for more spit. <laughs> so you see, lawlessness is in the heart. And what we need to do is take the policeman off the street corner and put the policeman in our heart. And so the very first thing that I want you to see today is the rebellion that proves our sinfulness. Let's read verse 4 again. Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now you may think that this transgression is just some little piccadillo. And you may think that, well, I haven't really sinned that much. So let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever taken anything ever that didn't belong to you? Whether it was just a nickel off your mother's dresser or a toy out of the neighbor's yard, or you stole an answer in school by cheating up and looking on somebody else's paper at school, or even if you have robbed a bank and stuff. How many of you ever in one time have one time taken something that didn't belong to you? Well, how many of you have ever told a lie? At least one time. <laughs> And I don't care if it was a white lie or a black lie or technicolor. It makes no difference. Well, I believe we have a congregation today of liars and thieves. <laughs> well, that's funny. But you know why it's funny? Because we think, well, gee, we may have taken a nickel and we may have told a fib or something. But you see, what we don't realize is that what we do is not the problem. It's what we are that is the problem. Man is not a liar because he tells lies. He tells lies because he's a liar. A man is not a thief because he steals. He steals because he is a thief. And you see, the problem is in the human heart. Now, we may be very sophisticated and, and very smug about it, but I want to tell you, my precious friend, that if you knew the sin that lurks down in the human heart, the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And that is yours, ma'am, and yours, sir, because your heart is wicked. We see that in little children. But sin is a transgression of the law. 
And also, first of all, you see the rebellion that proves our sinfulness. Number two, I want you to see in contrast this. Here we're moving along, and here it is, that righteousness that proclaims our sonship. Righteousness proclaims our sonship. Now, we know that he, that's Jesus, was manifested. Means incarnated or made known so he could take our sins away. In him there is no sin. And so whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now, if we are in Christ, if we are saved, and the Bible says that we are not going to sin if we're in Christ. And we have a lot of people who say that they're saved, and we have a lot of people that say that they're on their way to heaven, but there's been no change in their life. They don't haven't changed, not at all. And this is the reason that I call them baptized pagans, because there really has been no change. It reminds me of Constantine. He decided to go ahead and be a Christian and fight for the Lord, so he ended up baptizing the whole army, and they all fought for the Lord, but they were baptized pagans. They weren't saved and born again. They're fighting for Jesus like a heathen. And you can't baptize anybody. We believe in a believer's baptize. You have to believe and know that Jesus is your Lord and come to him that way. And then you get baptized. You don't just get baptized. What does that do? You just become a baptized pagan. Listen to me. The Bible says that if any man is in Christ, he becomes a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And if your religion has not changed your life, you better change your religion on your paper. Your religion. Because you don't have the Bible kind of salvation. Now, we have today sort of an easy believism where people say, oh, do you believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah. Oh, do you believe that he died for your sins? Oh, yeah. And then you're saved. No, you're not. The devil believes that and he believes and trembles. He's not saved. Listen to me. You are saved only when you bow your knee to Jesus. I mean, when you make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. And yes, that's an act of faith. But friend, it is a change. And to bow your knee to Him, there is evidence in your life. And again, if a religion has not changed your life, you better change your religion because you don't have the Bible kind. Now, I want to make it very clear here that you're not saved by reforming your life. I mean, our Lord never tells us to clean up, therefore He'll save us. It's backwards. We come to Jesus the way we are. But friend, Jesus did not come to save us in our sin. He came to save us, on your outline, from our sins. He came to save us from our sins, not in our sins. Look again what it says in verse 5. And you know that He was manifested to take away our sins. And in Him there is no sin. So whosoever abideth in Him sinneth not. That's the problem. We have a whole bunch of people that don't abide it in Jesus. And then what He is saying is that, uh, that if you belong to Him, then we are going to be on your outline like Him. If you abide in Him, you're going to be like Him. The Jesus in you will come out. Look at it, it says in verse 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. That's the righteousness that proclaims our salvation. However, if you're not righteous, he means, and that means that you are not on your outline saved. You see, think about it, the very word Christian. Do you know what the word Christian means? It means Christ-like. Christ-like. And in Christ there is no sin. So you can't be Christ-like and live a life of sin. Let's slow down a little bit. It says in verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not. Now that word abide means to be at home with. For example, if I were to say, you know, come and abide in my house, that would mean live in my house and dwell with me. Be at my home right here. And it means of a union and a communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a difference. Now, the reason that so many people are still living in sin with their names on church rolls is that they've met creeds, but they've never met Christ. They have met codes, but they've never met Christ. They've met causes, but they've never met Christ. They've met churches. They may go to church all the time, but they have not met Christ because it's when we abide in Him, it says... 
we sin not. Now that brings a real problem because all of us know that we Christians fail. In verse 6 again, and slow down and pay attention to this now. Here it says, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. And so this is not talking about sinless perfection. I mean, you see that there is nobody sinlessly perfect. If you study the Bible, you're going to look at the lives of all the saints and you're going to go find out, for example, that Abraham lied about his wife and Moses lost his temper and Peter denied the Lord and David was unfaithful and all through you're going to find out that the saints of the Old Testament and the New Testament where the Bible shows their faults and their failures. They are examples for us because we all may fail. And yet this passage of Scripture says that if we abide in Him, we sin not. Now, I don't want to be too technical, but I want you to listen very carefully that this in the Greek language is in the present and continuous tense. So abide is in the present tense. That means now. So what does it mean exactly? It simply means that if you're a Christian, you do not have sin for your, on your outline, your lifestyle. That's what it means. One translation gives it this way. When a man abides in him, he does not make sin his Practice. Another translation is he does not have a sinning lifestyle. A New American Standard says that if he is born of God, he does not practice sin. Now all these things mean the same thing. And I tell you, it speaks the same in a number of translations. One translation says that he does not habitually sin. Another one says that he does not live in sin. Now that does not mean that you can't slip and fall. But it does not mean that you can't make some mistakes either. And it meant that John, if it meant that, then John has completely lost his mind because John who wrote this said in 1 John 1.10 that if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. However, then he says, if we abide in him, we will not sin. Now you know that John, of all people, was a reasonable person. And what he is saying is this, that when you give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a change, a radical, dramatical change. Yes. Amen. Now, because you are saved, you have the nature of God in you. And we're going to see about that, talk about that a little later here now. But if you are saved, your life has changed and you will try to abide in him. You will try to. You do not habitually practice sin anymore. I think I can clear it up even more when we back up. In this epistle right here, if you look at 1 John 2, 1, look what it says. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. Please, sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now that it is, that it is God's desire for us that we don't sin. However, if we slip and fall, Jesus Christ is there and an advocate is just a fancy word for lawyer. Yeah. Amen. So ultimately, we have someone that's going to plead our case before heaven. Now, this is really helps us here. Now, let's look at three and four. I want to read it. And hereby, we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Do you think that John had been maybe at a testimony meeting sometime and heard somebody say, oh, I know him. I know Jesus. And John said, you're a liar. I know your lifestyle. You don't know him. You're not keeping his commandments. And the word keep is a navigational word from back then. It was a word that sailors used back in that day. And when they didn't have radar and they didn't have global positioning satellites and things, they didn't have NOLAD and things like this, to keep the ships on track. And ultimately they would cross the sea and they would steer by the stars. And it was because those stars up there are fixed in heaven. And just like God's laws are fixed. And so those sailors would put their eyes upon the stars and they would steer by the stars. And do you know that what they would be call it when they would be steering by the stars? Keeping the stars. Keeping the stars. That means that this is the course that I'm keeping. I am sailing by the stars up there that are fixed in heaven. That's what I sail by, and that is my course. Now, the Bible says that if we know Him, we are going to keep His commandments. 
And we are going to steer by God's stars, as it were. And that means that we're going to keep His Word. Now, that doesn't mean that, that a sailor couldn't get blown off the course or something. It doesn't mean that in a time of distraction that he might misturn the wheel or something. But it does mean that he has a guide for his life. He has a direction and that he's going. And he has a fixed standard that he's going by. Now, here's the question. Do you? That's the question. Do you? And so God sent me here to tell you that if you do not care for God's commandments, or you don't know about them, or you're living your willy-nilly little life, doing as you please, not caring about God's commandments, not steering by God's stars, if you're habitually practicing sin, then you don't know Him, and you are not saved. You are a baptized pagan. That is, if you've even been baptized. Some haven't. First commandment that he gives, get baptized after you believe that he is your Lord. And John says, hey, don't let anybody deceive you. The problem is today, folks, that we have a lot of folks who have joined churches that have never met Jesus. And I mean, they have never, ever really been saved. And many of them have gone to church for years. Years. So what he is saying is that there's a rebellion that proves our sinfulness. There is a righteousness that proves our sonship. And we demonstrate it by like father, like son. You see, that's the rebellion that proves our sinfulness and the righteousness that proves our sonship. And I, you say, okay, well, I understand, but you know something, Pastor? I just don't have what it takes to live that way. I don't have what it takes. Well, neither do I. Here's the third and most important thing on your outline. Third, number three, the redemption that provides our salvation. Yes. You see, when God tells us how that we are to live, that doesn't mean that we can automatically do it apart from Him. Look what it says back in 1 John 3, verse 5. It says, And ye know that He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him there is no sin. So our Lord doesn't just give us these commandments and say, Well, now if you live by these, you can go to heaven. Because, I mean, what about, let's talk about first the sins that we've already committed. You see, Jesus has manifested to take away my sins. Give me an example. Do you remember in Leviticus 16, and we've gone over this, there was the ritual of the scapegoat. And the high priest would take two scapegoats, and both of these goats would represent us. The high priest would lay his hands on one of the goats and confess the sins of the people, and he would be placing the sins of the people on the head of that goat, and then that goat would be killed. And well, that goat pictures, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ showing our sins were laid upon him, and that he died for our sins. And that's it. He died on the cross for our sins. But then afterwards, then he would take another goat, and he would lead that goat called the scapegoat away and into the wilderness, never to return again. That picture is Jesus taking away our sins into the grave of God's forgetfulness, never, never, ever to be remembered. Of course, He remembers, but what it means, it will never bring up our sins against us again, those sins. And so listen, that, what is the redemption that provides our salvation? It's this. Number one, we are redeemed from the penalty of sin. First of all, we're redeemed from the penalty on your outline. Jesus took that away, and that's what he says when it says he was manifested to take away our sins. Remember when John the Baptist saw him? John 1, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, he taketh away the sin of the world. However, not only did he redeem me from the penalty of sin, because I still need help. There's more. But the good news is, he also redeemed me from, on your outline, the power of Satan. Look again what it says here in 1 John 3, 7 and 8. It says, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the very beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now that's the second reason that he came. So the first reason was he came that he would take away our sins. The second reason he came is so he could destroy the power of the devil. Now I'm redeemed from my penalty of sin and I'm also redeemed from the power of Satan. Now John is saying that if you're still living like the devil, then you're not convicted because the Holy Spirit came to convict people of sin. 
It's because you, on your outline, belong to the devil. If you can stand and not feel guilty about it. Now, sometimes we criticize Hollywood and the pornographers and the liquor dealers and all these bad people and what they do and stuff. And we say, oh, they sin. But of course they do. They're sinners. That's what sinners are supposed to do. I mean, what else would they do not being saved? They're sinners. You see, that he that committed sin is of the devil. And ultimately, that's the problem in many churches. We don't teach people how to really be saved. We get them, and we get them in the church, and rather than the church being the sheepfold, sheep wanting to come together, it becomes a zoo, which everybody gets in, and nobody gets out, and they teach that the church saves. But the church doesn't save. And then the pastor spends all this time trying to teach Billy Goats not the buck. <laughs> trying to get unsaved people not to sin. No, no. They're sinners, though. They can't help it. But he that committed sin is of the devil. They need a heart change. They're just not saved. But that's why they sin. Notice what it says here now in verse 8. It says this, He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now the word destroy does not mean annihilate. In the Greek language, it means to make on your outline ineffective. God didn't take the devil away. If God took the devil away, nobody would have an opportunity to be good. Everybody would just live their willy-nilly life. He needs the devil here to, to tempt you to see if you're going to trust him or not. This is a trial period on this earth. But he makes him powerless. He makes him ineffective. And we use that term today like he wiped me out. Jesus just wiped him out on the cross. That's what it means. He won the war on the cross. He wiped him out and put him out of commission. For the believers, not on your outline, he wiped him out for the believers, not the unbelievers. He rendered him helpless. And so Jesus of the cross ruined Satan's kingdom. And Satan has no power or authority over you. However, he does the unsaved. He does. Now before you were saved, you were Satan's slave. You were Satan's dirty little plaything, and you say, well, I was free then. Well, listen, you just thought you were free. You were free to do what you wanted, but you were not free to do as you ought. You didn't have the power to not do it. You were Satan's slave, and Jesus has come to set you free from sinning. Jesus has come to destroy the destroyer. One day he'll take him out of the picture, but not right now. And because I have new life in the Lord Jesus Christ, first of all, I will never have to face the penalty of my sins because Jesus took the penalty away. And secondly, I can tell Satan to go sit on attack. I don't have to listen to him. I don't have to obey him at all anymore. His power is broken, but only when I try to obey the Lord. We say, well, I just felt like being bad, and so I'm bad, and you just, well, that's it. And stuff. But you've got to try. It's about our will. We need to exercise good will, the will of God. And Jesus has destroyed the power of Satan for the believers only. And if you don't understand that, folks, you're not going to be able to live the Christian life. And I'm telling you that what we are talking about here is something real. Jesus came to destroy the destroyer. And we are not at home yet now. I'm talking about the redemption that provides our salvation. So not only does he deliver us from the power of Satan, but next he also delivers us from the principle of self. You see, if Jesus just dealt with my sin and that's all, and he just forgives me and stuff, listen, I still have me to deal with. My desire to sin. I want to sin. You know, but the desire goes away when you submit to the Lord. And I am my own worst enemy. So again, Jesus has redeemed me from the penalty of my sin, but also Jesus has redeemed me from the principle on your outline of self. He's delivered me from the principle of self. My water. He's changed my water. Not only did he die for my sin, he died for me, for what I am on your outline. What I am. And this is to keep me from doing these sins in the future. Listen to what it says in verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin, because he is born of God. You see, when you get saved, and I'm talking about the principle of self now, 
Number one, or first of all, you get a new, on your outline, a dynamic. You get a new dynamic, and when he, we call this being born again. Like when I was born the first time, I had physical life. But when I received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and Lord, I received a spiritual life. Now, do you remember what Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, 6? He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And you see, everybody has had a fleshly birth, but not everybody has had a spiritual birth. Look again what it says in verse 9. See how it says, whosoever is born of God doesn't commit sin. Whosoever is born of God doesn't commit sin. So how are you born of God? Well, we know that I was born of Norman and Barbara Bergstrom, because those are my physical parents. But what is my spiritual parents exactly? Well, here they are on your outline. The Word of God and the Spirit of God. And the Word of God and the Spirit of God in the womb of grace has made me a new person. And you see, the Bible says, being born again, not of corruptible seed or sperm, not of, but it's of incorruptible by the Word of God. So you see, the Bible is my spiritual Father, the Word of God. That's why Jesus can also be my Father. Because I was born of the Word of God. And you can't separate the God of that Word from the Word of that God. So I am born there, but also it takes something else. It takes the other partner. It takes the Spirit that quickens. The Spirit is what makes it alive. The breath in Adam is what made him spiritually alive. The Spirit quickens and it gives life. And it is clear that Jesus said that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. So you can take the Word of God and the Spirit of God and there's a conception in the womb of on your outline, grace. In the womb of grace, you become a new person and when you become a new person, then dear friends, you have a new life and you have a new dynamic and now you're not dependent upon just trying to do it because now He's going to give you power because of this new life that has come in you to help you. And you see, when I was a young man, I received Christ into my heart and I was born again and I received a new dynamic. And because I have a new dynamic, I'm a new creature now. And I'm changing. He's changing me. And listen carefully because here's the second thing. Here it is. Secondly, now I have a new desire. I have a new desire. I have more of what I want because I pray in the will of God. I don't want to win the lottery. I'm not praying to get a brand new car. I'm not praying for these material things. I'm praying for somebody to be saved. I'm praying for different things. And I don't want some of these earthly things because I care more about my soul in heaven than I do about all these earthly things down here. Verse 9, let's read verse 9. And whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And what does that mean? It means his seed remaineth in him. Well, my father's seed remains in me. For example, physically, I'm a Bergstrom. I mean, if you see my father, you would recognize that I'm a child of Norman Bergstrom. And his natural life is in me. However, when I was saved, I was born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. And so likewise, that there is this divine life principle that is in me also now. And that principle gives me not only a new dynamic, but it gives me a new desire. And one translation says that God's nature abides in him or me if I'm born again. And what is God's nature? God's nature is, on your outline, holiness. It's not just love. It's love and judgment. Love and conviction. The gospel is not a two-headed coin. There's both sides, love and judgment. I mean, what did he give us laws for if he's just love? What difference does it make then? He doesn't want us to break those laws, does he? And if we do, does he go, no problem. How would you like your judge at the courthouse to go, oh, you killed somebody? No problem. No, we have laws and he has a judgment for this. He doesn't do it to us now. Things can happen to us, but the judgment is yet to come. But the conviction in our heart, the Holy Spirit was sent to convict us of the things that we do wrong. Look at verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. If Jesus Christ is in you through the new birth, not only are you going to have a new dynamic, you're going to have a new desire. And do not have this conviction and this judgment. You don't want to break God's heart. 
you care about those things, and you know I believe in eternal security. And I hope you do too. Now I believe that once you get saved, that you can never be unsaved anymore. Just like that, I could never be unborn physically. And so I am born of God now. And when I was born physically, that was settled once and for all. And I can't be born again physically anymore. But likewise, I can't be born spiritually again. Because once I came to the Lord Jesus Christ, I got saved and God's nature came into me. And I now have the nature of God in me. And the nature of God in me says that I don't want to sin. Now I might, but I don't want to. You know, some people say, well, if I had, if I believed in eternal security, I'd get saved and I'd just sin all I want to. Well, I sin all I want to. But with this new life in me, I don't want to. And that's how you can tell if somebody's born again. Now, if you want to sin, then you need to get your water fixed. I'm saying you need a new water. And also you need to be born again because you get a new dynamic and automatically when you do, you get a new desire. Do you have a new desire in your life to be good? To seek God with the whole heart and not be a sinner? From the moment I gave my heart to Jesus Christ and God is listening that there has been a new desire in my heart to live for Him and that means obedience to His Word. And not only obedience to His Word, but my spirit is alive when I hear the things that I'm supposed to do. The Word of God makes me alive because I want to know the things that He wants me to do and doesn't want me to do. Now, if you don't have that desire, you better check up on this thing called salvation. Don't let anybody deceive you. He that committeth sin is of the devil because that's the way the devil does it. And when it says that he is righteous, it means that he has the Spirit of God in him. And if he is born of God, his seed remains in him. And you can tell he's saved because he has this new desire. And that's how you can tell if somebody says that they're saved or not. A lot of people just say, I believe in Jesus, and you can't tell it, you know. If they were arrested for being a Christian, they wouldn't be convicted. Does that make any sense to you? Now, here's the third and final thing that I want to tell you. We talked about how we are being delivered now, not only from the penalty of sin and the power of Satan, but also from the principle of self. So first, I have a new dynamic. God's life is in me. And secondly, I have a new desire and I want to be like Him because He is in me now and I am in Him and I am abiding in Him. But then thirdly, I have a new, on your outline, deterrent. Deterrent. D-E-T-E-R-R-E-N-T. -E -E That's the third thing. And so again, it says in verse 9, He cannot sin because He's born of God. And if the God that I know lives in you, again, this is present in continual sense. He's working now. And you cannot habitually live in sin without conviction. If the Spirit's in you, you just can't do it. See, if Jesus Christ is in you, you can't go through carelessly and thoughtlessly and continuously practicing a lifestyle of sin. You just can't do it, not if you're born again, because God will carry you to the woodshed and beat the daylights out of you. He will. You will be miserable. The most unhappiest person in the world is a Christian that's out of fellowship. Because the Holy Spirit of God will get in you and He will tear you up and work in you and dwell in you because He is delivering you. He who started a good work and you will complete it. He will complete it. He's working on you and not only from the penalty of sin and the power of Satan, but from the principle of self. Because when you were born again, you have received this new nature. And with that new nature, you have a new dynamic, you have a new desire, you have a new deterrent. And where you are living for Jesus, it matters to you. Now listen to me and I'll say it again. The devil would just as soon send you to hell from the pew as he would the gutter. Because the devil loves bad Christians. Bad Christian example. Ha <laughs> ha, look at him. When people look at them, they go, well, he can do it. Why can't I do it? And the devil goes, oh, I just love bad Christians. And every now and then people will come up and say, hey, Pastor, did you know there's hypocrites in the church? I go, really? <laughs> and then they say, well, you know, I'm a Christian, though, and... I say, well, you better be washed in the blood of Christ. Right now I'm asking you, do you really know the Lord Jesus Christ? So remember what we've learned. There's the rebellion that proves our sinfulness. There is the trans, which is sin, the transgression of the law. 
And then there's a righteousness that proclaims our sonship means you want to be good. And that's the way that we know that we've been saved because we want to be good. And finally, there's the redemption that provides our salvation. The redemption redeems us from the penalty of sin, from the power of Satan, and from the principle of self. And that is what real salvation is. So this is what we need to do. Last on your outline, the Bible says to do it, let a man examine himself, whether he be in the faith. Examine yourselves. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Here's the question. Are you saved? If this was the last moment that you were here, do you know that you would be in heaven? If the rapture was to come tomorrow, do you know that you would be one of the ones to go? You know we're getting close. When we look at our world, it's pretty pathetic. Would you pray a prayer right now? You can be saved right now. Let's pray. Pray to yourself. Dear God, I have broken your law and I am a sinner. My sin deserves judgment, but I need mercy, Lord. I need to be redeemed from the penalty of sin. I need to be redeemed from the power of Satan especially. And I need to be redeemed from the principle of self. Lord, I need to be saved from me. So Lord Jesus, thank you for paying for my sin with your blood on the cross. Thank you for dying for me, dear Lord. Thank you for taking my place. And by faith, I accept you. I receive you into my heart right now, dear Lord. I want to make you my Lord and Savior, so take control of my heart right now, Lord. Begin making me the person that you want me to be. Help me, help me never to be ashamed of you. Help me to try to be good, and help me to want to be with you. Help me with the things I go through. I just thank you, Lord. I trust you will do it. I don't live on a feeling or ask for a sign. I live by the promises that you've given. And I do trust you, Lord. I do trust you. Save me right now, dear Lord. Save me, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. We have one last song, and then I will excuse you. I don't know what I'm going to do, but you're going to get out five minutes early today. So I hope that's not a problem or anything. We're going to sing a song here called Beautiful Because Jesus is Beautiful. Here we go. Let's sing right now. person in, in, in such a big way, Lord. I just pray that you would just keep a hedge of protection around them and help them be bold in sharing you with others and telling others how important it is that they know you. Lord, I pray that you would just help everyone with their afflictions and just let them have a really good day. Lord, bless them really, really good. We just thank you for how you work, Lord, and we thank you for being so beautiful in our life. So, Lord, as we come to you today and we ask for these blessings and we thank you again for what you've done to these people in this church, we just ask for all of these things, Lord, in your precious name we pray, in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen.
and go with God and have a great day today. I hope you have a wonderful day today. Tell somebody you love the Lord. Thank you.